eternally. Come on, nobody has any experience of that. But if we depend on our own experience, we'll never understand what's beyond us, because we're limited. For so many days, in so many ways, I've been searching for the key. Watching nature grow, wishing I could know all about the things I see. Seeing life and death in a passing breath, life is such a mystery to me. Well, of course we're limited, no one argues with that. But when people, one by one, contribute new discoveries, then there's progress. Well, just look how far we've come in the last hundred years. Well, in a way, you're right. But what if we want to know something we can't measure or see? Something that's outside our view, outside our grasp. What then? But in science, nobody imagines anything. We deal with what we can observe, what we can measure, touch, see. Yeah, that's what the frog was doing. All he could see was his own little well. And from that, he thought he could figure out everything. Everything outside his well. Just like in your biology department. They study matter, and from that they try to figure out what life is. I mean, from what they know, they're making theories about what they don't know. Is that knowledge? I don't know, Peter. Everything you've been telling me goes against what I've been studying for years. That may be so, but it makes sense, doesn't it? Maybe. It's something to think about. Anyway, I got a biology lab. I gotta go. So I'll see you later, Peter. I'll <laughs> see you later, Mark. They're trying to figure out what life is. Four and a half billion years ago, Earth's molten surface was covered with lava and gases. As it cooled through the millennia, the gases condensed. Torrential rains fell and mixed with carbon monoxide, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen to form what is known as the primordial soup Giant electrical storms and ultraviolet radiation charged the mixture, and in an orderly and natural way, carbon compounds, the building blocks of life, formed. This is how non-living matter transformed itself into what we call life, chemicals that can reproduce themselves. What did he say life is? Chemicals that can reproduce themselves. From what they know, they're making theories about what they don't know. Is that knowledge? Today's lab's about metamorphosis, the life cycle of Lepidoptera, and then a short lecture. I guess I'll start by studying its wing venation. I used to wonder what made things alive. That's what Peter was talking about all through lunch. Hey, Peter, where were you? Class went overtime. Henderson. Boy, you're really into it, huh? I sure am. It's the best course I've ever had. We're studying the Gita. The Gita? So what's that? Is that your uh, text? Yeah, the Bhagavad Gita as it is. It was written down 5,000 years ago in the Sanskrit language. The Sanskrit language? <laughs> well, you really found something to chew on, eh, Peter? Have I ever. Why don't you have an apple instead? Come on, Mark. I'm really excited about this. 
Really? Yeah. Okay, so what's it about? Well, here, I'll show you. From childhood to youth to old age, the material body is always changing. But within the body is an antimaterial particle. It never changes, but always stays the same. Hmm. I've heard of antimatter. Yeah, antimatter has qualities exactly opposite to the qualities of matter. Material things come and go, but antimatter remains the same. It's permanent. That's not what I heard. That must be the uh, Gita's theory, huh? It's not just a theory. It's something we can perceive. We can actually perceive antimatter. Mm. How's that? Well, by understanding that although the body's constantly changing, you're still the same person. You don't change. So the thing is, who are you? The one who's not changing. Well, it's, it's just my memory. I can remember when I was younger, but that doesn't really explain it. It's just a function of the brain. Well, the reason I'm the same person as I always was is because of the genetic code that keeps working inside all the cells in my body. So the new cells are just like the old ones. It's all due to the genetic code. So you are a genetic code? Well, the genetic I... code is just a mechanism. It ensures that your cells change in a uniform way. But does it explain who you are? Does it explain your continuing identity? So you're saying that my body is matter and that I'm anti-matter. And that matter is not conscious, but anti-matter is. Exactly. Without the anti-material particle, the body's dead. The Gita says this particle is alive and makes the body appear alive. The body grows because this living force is in it. Since the living force is in it, the body continues to grow. Cells and living things are in constant flux, growing, dividing. Gradually the whole organism changes. From childhood to youth to old age, the material body is always changing. <laughs> <laughs> but within the body is an antimaterial particle. It never changes, but always stays the same. You're still the same person, although your body continues to change.
life is strictly a material phenomenon. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Fifteen other elements. All these elements, as you know, are common. They're found all over the planet. All of the functions of the human body can be explained in terms of the interactions of these chemicals. So, you can see, there's nothing extraordinary going on here. There's no special ingredient called life. The way the chemicals combine makes life seem extraordinary. But really, life is just a complex organization of material elements. Life isn't produced when chemicals interact. This combination of blood and tissues and organs doesn't make me alive. Well, the only thing you find in the body is chemicals. I mean, what else could it be? If we're just chemicals, then where's the source of all the energy in the body? They've analyzed all the parts and systems, right? Yeah. So, what's alive in the body? Where are you? Think of the body's different parts. Well, there are bones. Nerves, the brain, muscles, lungs, the liver, kidneys, the heart, the circulatory system, corpuscles, the cell, the nucleus, chromosomes, genes, DNA, RNA and the atom. Yes, the atoms in living bodies are the same as those in dead objects. So where are you? Where's the life in these material things? Well, what we call life is a very complex combination of atoms. Atoms form molecules and molecules form cells and organs that have the characteristics of life. But what's the source of energy for these parts? Where is consciousness? Well, many different parts of the body work together to make me what I am. But the parts can be replaced with machines. The heart-lung machine, the kidney machine, and you'll still be alive. So where is life? In the machines? Well, what about the brain? The brain's like a sophisticated computer. A part to help you see parts to let you hear and understand, parts to store information, parts to control your motor functions, parts for reasoning and decision making. But where is life? Where are you? Well, we don't know. It evades your investigation. You can say life is a chemical reaction, but can you prove it? Well, you can't prove that antimatter exists in the body. You can't prove it's there by doing experiments. There's no machine that'll register the living force. But you can experience it. You know, you see the sunshine all over, and you know it's coming from the sun. In that way, you feel consciousness all over your body, because it's coming from the antimaterial spark. This particle is even smaller than the atom and is in the heart of every living being. When blood passes through the heart, it gathers energy from the antimaterial spark. That's how consciousness spreads throughout the body. Well then, how do you explain death? Well, it's not a loss of chemicals, that's for sure. A dead body has all the same chemicals it had when it was alive. DNA, RNA, enzymes, hormones, everything. So what's the difference between life and death? When the antimaterial spark, the living force, leaves, the body's useless. And when that happens, when that force leaves the body, there's nothing in the world you can do to bring life back. Okay, let's check for any more bleeders. Get a sponge count. 
Should I loosen the retractor? A bit. Looks good. All right, we're ready to close. Have some top and ABDs ready for the dressing. And we'll use clamps on the skin. I can't get a blood pressure. What? There's no electrical activity. The monitor's flat. His heart stopped. Mm -hmm. Quick, call cardiac arrest. Call four. Call four. I'll give him cardiac massage. Give him concentrated O2 per mask. Right. Any activity at all? None. Come on. Come on. Any activity? No, still none. Let's try some adrenaline. Keep your eye on the monitor. Watch for any pattern changes after the meds given. Right. The IV's out. You want uh, D5 and W or normal saline? Uh, that was a normal saline. Joe, I speak normal saline. Any change? Still flat. How about shock? Yeah. Get the paddles. Okay. Get back. Set it on 200. Hit it. There's no tone. The stimulation's ineffective. We can't bring him back. It's all over. It's finished. There's nothing we could do to save him. Death, quietly, suddenly makes us bereft. Our brother is now departed, and we commit his body to the ground. Remember, man, that thou art dust, and unto dust thou shalt return. From earth to earth, from ashes to ashes, from dust to dust, amen. The lovable object is the imperishable living spark within. No one loves a dead body. So, biologists now know that life can be explained in terms of the same chemical, physical laws that describe matter. Because, as we have seen, life is just a complex organization of matter. Now, the interesting thing is that in the future, we expect to be able to produce life here in the laboratory by combining, through extremely sophisticated means, these very elements that are found all around us. This will be very exciting. It will be the culmination of centuries of study and experiment. Now, prior to the 1900s, I want to get into now some of the issues that historically have confronted microbiologists. We're using material instruments, so all we can see will be material elements. How can we see the living force? It's beyond our power to see. They always say, in the future, in the future we'll understand, we'll create life. But it doesn't seem reasonable. It seems more like an empty promise. Matter by itself doesn't seem to have any of the qualities of life. Consciousness, the will to live, direction, desire. How could matter ever start being conscious of itself? Even after millions of years.
Well, suppose there is an antimaterial particle in every living thing. The birds, the trees, plants, and people. But all these bodies are very different. So is the particle in each body also different? Antimaterial particles are different in the sense that each one is an individual. But at the same time, the antimaterial particles in all the different kinds of bodies are equal. From a spiritual viewpoint, all living things are equal. If we think, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm American, I'm Chinese, I'm young, I'm old, I'm white, I'm black, I'm Christian, I'm Jewish, I'm Hindu. We think we belong to a particular family and country and race and faith. But these names apply only to the body. They have nothing to do with us. Each of us is an anti-material particle, a pure spiritual particle, eternally. But the answer's clear, it was always here I don't have to wonder why When I see life spark, lighting up the dark Like the sun lights up the sky I can see the truth in old age or youth It's the soul that doesn't die Now fly Looking for answers Spending my days in darkness Life was a puzzle The soul is the part I 